Good evening. So, who doesn't want to come to Spooky Sunday? Right? So, um, anyway, I hear that God has blessed you in a pretty cool way. Um, last time I was here, this was another church, and you were like on borrowed time. And uh, God worked some stuff out, and here you are. So God worked some stuff out, and here you are. Yeah, yeah. Don't be afraid to talk back. It's all right. So, um, so in, and now you've got, like, like, youth group and stuff, and you don't have to go to somebody's house and meet in their garage. You just get come to your church and do your thing. So that's... Uh, pretty amazing. So anyway, let me pray and we will jump into this. Uh, Me and my wife are at the Nugget and we've got a 830 bingo game that we need to get to. So anyway, let's pray. Father, we're grateful to be in your presence because we know you're here. So Father, we would now invite you to open our hearts to the truth of your word. Lord, we live in a world that often has us confused, that often has us frustrated, and many times just makes us angry. But in the midst of that, God, you've called us to live out our faith. And so, Lord, as we look back at Jesus and his followers living under the boot heel of Rome with an illegal religion, God, you did some pretty cool stuff there. So we would ask now that in this day and in this age, that you might use us as your church, that we might change the world as well. Because that's still possible, because we are still drawing breath, and you're still the God of heaven and earth. And we ask that now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, um, I got a heavy Bible, because I'm an old man with big print. So, uh, Anyway, thanks for having us here. We are glad. And uh, as I said, Dawson already told me about the good news that come to Mountainside. And um, it's good to be here. Uh, You know, I'd like to have been here on your first Sunday and like got to preach that Sunday. But apparently I get one of the last Sunday evenings. So I want to thank Dawson for that. Uh, But anyway, what a great opportunity. And how awesome is it to have your place? How awesome is it to have... A church that is yours where setting up and tearing down doesn't have to happen. At Community Church, we did that for 12 years. We lived out of a trailer. We went from the movie theater to the high school, up to the college, back to the movie theater. And then we ultimately built our building about 10 years ago. But having your space, it creates limitless ministry, right? And as a pastor, I'd be failing if I didn't encourage you in what other responsibilities come with a new building. And, you know, I don't want to overplay that tonight, but I do want to talk about that. And um, so my wife and I moved to Sacramento 10 months ago. We spent 31 years in Susanville, and when we walked into church, we were loved and we loved others. When we went to Walmart, we were loved and we were loved by others. It didn't matter where we went, but after 31 years, we had some relationships. So let me tell you, not every church is the same because we've been church shopping. So don't judge us, but in Sacramento, we're church shopping. And it is the weirdest, hardest thing that I think we've ever done is to church shop. Not all churches are created equal. And there's lots of ways to do good church. And let me tell you, there's lots of ways to do bad church. And not every church does it the same way. And uh, you have to stick around a church for a while to see what it's all about. And sometimes sticking around church isn't easy. So this evening, that's our starting point. And we're going to go through a number of things tonight, and I hope it's not too long. But uh, take your Bibles, your phones, whatever you have, and um, we will get started. And we're going to start with what we call church. What we call church. And um, as I said, there's lots of ways to do church. But it should be a place where we know each other and other people know us, right? To know and be known is very important in a congregation. 
It's a very important part of a church. In fact, David makes mention of this in Psalm 133, verse 1. He says, how wonderful it is, how pleasant it is for brothers and sisters to dwell together in harmony. And harmony is built on common goals by people with a common vision, and they come together and they work towards that common goal and vision. And that creates harmony. And so within the church context, it should be enjoyable and harmonious. And you all frown back at me. Within the church, it should be harmonious and joyful, right? It should be a pleasure to come to church because now my wife and I go to church and it's not really a pleasure. Because you know what? Everybody else hugs and shake hands and me and my wife smile and look around. And that's hard. Especially when you've come from a church where you were known and knew others. And so I just want to tell you, you know, this is just for free. When people start coming here and they're new, love them. Don't let them just watch you hug other people. Love them and welcome them. And that's just because my feelings are hurt because we haven't found a church yet. So that was for free. So um, anyway... When we talk about the church context, especially as we work together for God's kingdom, which is the primary emphasis of Jesus' teaching, it's kingdom, not building, right? It's kingdom, not building. Although a building makes it really easy, much easier to work for the kingdom with a building. And so Jesus teaches kingdom, not building. Not the church building. But the Gospels are filled with stories and parables about the kingdom of God. Regardless of the state of the world, whether people know it or not, God's kingdom is present. Okay, whether the world knows it or not, God's kingdom is present. Okay, three of you. Whether the world recognizes it or not, God's kingdom is present. That's part of who we are. He said, the kingdom is here. And we need to live like the kingdom is here. And we need to work like the kingdom is here. And we need to live as if we know the kingdom wins in the end. So, throughout the Gospels, we can find Jesus teaching on the characteristics of his kingdom. People reflect the character of God in the world in order to expand God's kingdom, right? We we reflect the character of Jesus in order to expand his kingdom in this world. Gathering is of great importance. Where we gather, not so much. You know that, I know that. Where we gather, not so much. But gathering is important. But unfortunately, in today's world, we must be conscious of the consumer mentality, right? How's your nursery? How do you treat your children? Are your workers screened? And on and on and on it goes. Because if you don't do what I like here, I can go down the street and they'll do what I like. You see, in many churches, leaderships walk a tightrope between being seeker sensitive and being uh, teaching sound biblical principles. It's hard. It's hard to do that. So turn with me in Matthew 14. We're going to look at a couple things. Matthew 14. This is a story where Jesus feeds 5,000. Jesus feeds 5,000, and a crowd is gathered to listen to him, and he's teaching on a remote hillside, and the gathering brings his followers, the curious, the skeptical. There's no sanctuary. There's no worship team. There's no liturgy. There's no communion. Only Jesus talking about one thing. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of God in real time. Jesus is there in flesh and blood, and he's talking, and he's teaching. And then they share a meal with those gathered on the hillside. And that would clearly be the model throughout the New Testament. I'm sorry, I had you turn to Matthew. I wasn't even going to read from there. I am going to read from Acts chapter 2. So turn there, Acts chapter 2. Jesus sets the model. Gathering, eating together, teaching. Acts chapter 2, you know these verses. Acts chapter 2, verses 41 to 47. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized 
and added to the church that day 3,000 in all. Added to the church. Could you see the secretary doing the prayer requests on that first, when 3,000 are added? Oh my, could you imagine the prayer list that day? Could you imagine the pastor getting these 3,000 people ready for baptism? Could you imagine, uh, you be, uh, hey, we got 3,000 new people coming Sunday, so youth ministry, get ready. Children's ministry, get ready. It's going to be a big Sunday in the nursery. We got 3,000 people coming. Could we really handle that? So what were they added to? They were added to the church, about 3,000 in all. And all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. And a deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place, and they shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with the people in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper. They shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while, they were praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. And won't we look at that passage and go, oh man, if we could just go back to the first century. If we, if we could just be the New Testament church, well, guess what? We are the New Testament church. And this does happen on a weekly basis. It happens on a daily basis where two or three are gathered together. Who's in the midst? Okay, two of you read your Bible. When two or three are gathered together, who's in the midst? Okay, four of you read your Bible. When two or three are gathered together, who's in the midst? God is. That's church, isn't it? And so we've created this system in this culture that we've grown up with, and we call it church, but it's not church. So, and each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved, and immediately they began a building program and started a senior pastor search. <laughs> no, that's not my Bible. No, the truth is, Church was something very different from what it means to us today. This is a picture of community church. We built that 10 years ago. Building a church facility is horrendous. I would never recommend it, it but it was much needed. In Susanville, there was no building for sale that met what we needed, so we had to build our own. But understand, it's what you do in the building that makes it church. It's what you do amongst the community, amongst yourselves. That's what makes it church. You know, oh, we're going to church today. No, you're not. You're going to a building where the church gathers and we fellowship and we enjoy God's teaching and we worship in song and we share communion and we get great Bible teaching in the building where the church meets. You see, when we look at the New Testament, it was never about brick and mortar. It was never about cool worship teams. It was not about over-the-top kids ministry or a slick production. But we've grown up in the building, and we've grown up with the traditions that go with the building. But church is more than a place you visit for an hour on Sunday and worship God in song. You see, it's important for us to gather together on Sunday and any other time we see fit but don't think that Sunday morning in the building is the end all be all there's great value for us to gather any time and any place Matthew 18 20 you can turn there or just read it on the screen Jesus said for where two or three are gathered together as my followers I am among them isn't that good news wouldn't you want to be part of a gathering where Jesus is amongst you? Shouldn't we act like Jesus is amongst us? Sometimes we forget that Jesus was a fun guy. Jesus got invited to a lot of parties, right? Remember, they, we're going to look at one of those parties. He got invited to a lot of parties. 
And I think that when Jesus went to a dinner or Jesus went to a party, I think he was the center of attention. I think he was telling stories and he was telling parables and people were scratching their head and they were getting convicted. And so when we gather, we need to enjoy each other. We need to laugh together. So, Matthew 18, 24, where two or three are gathered, Jesus says, when my followers meet, I meet with you. And that should instill something into us. And from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. Isn't that a pretty cool deal? Living stones. <sighs> Living stones, you and I, and God's taking us, and he's building us into a spiritual temple. And you're not here by accident tonight. You don't go to Mountainside Community Church because, well, that's where I thought I would go. No, God says you're a stone in this building called Mountainside Community Church, which is part of the bigger church overall, right? He says... What's more, you are holy priests. You are his holy priests. You're a priest. Do you intercede for other people? Do you act as a priest with one another to share your burdens, to share your requests, to interact? You know, one thing about a priest, he talked to the people. We should be talking amongst ourselves as priests, as living stones. Through the mediation or the work of Jesus, you, verse 9, are chosen. Well, we are holy priests through the mediation work of Jesus. Verse 9 says, you are a chosen people. You are royal priests. You are a holy nation. You are God's very own possession. As a result, as a result of being God's, right? As a result of being God's, you can show others the goodness of God. Are you kidding me? I, because of me being a priest, because of me being a living stone, because of me being a holy nation, I can show others the goodness of God because he called me out of the darkness into his wonderful light because he called you out of his darkness into his wonderful light. Okay, he called you and me out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Okay, are you catching on how I do this yet? <laughs> so, let's jump to Hebrews chapter 10. You know this one, I'm sure you have. I know Dawson's preached on this. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 23. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to love and good deeds. Let us think of ways to be the church. Let us think of ways to be more harmonious. Let us think of ways how we can best minister to one another. And let us not neglect meeting together like some people do. Like some people do, they neglect meeting together because what we hear from the writer of Hebrews, meeting together is of great value. Meeting together is important because we just saw that Jesus is here when we meet. So it's important to meet together. So don't neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now as it's getting crazier and crazier and crazier. We need to meet more and more and more, right? So we can be encouraged so we can bear one another's burdens, so we can minister to each other. And then ultimately, what do we do? We turn that outward to the community around us. So the church is individual followers of Jesus who exist to continue and expand the kingdom work and ministry of Jesus. Yes? Our job. We are to continue and expand the work and ministry of Jesus, right? That's what we are called to do. So, let's talk about the church's job description, right? Church's job, do you know what your job description is? 
Because now you got a church, or at least a building, right? So now things will get harder, not easier. You knew that part, right? Because before you had, like, excuses. Well, you know, we don't have a building that's our own, and, you know, we have to meet in the park, and so, yeah, well, we can't do much for Jesus. Well, guess what, Jack? Now you, you've got responsibility. So what's a church's job description? We get this from a very popular passage in Matthew, and you can turn there, Matthew chapter 28. This will not be new to you, but Jesus has been crucified and resurrected, and 40 days after that, he assembles his followers in Galilee. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20. Act like you never heard this before. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Is that good news? Who's got authority down here? No, I'm sorry, it's not Joe Biden. Oh, it's not the Congress. No, it's not China. Who's got authority down here? That's right. Now, there's one that he has loosened for a season who will wreak havoc and cause division and problems and suffering, but he still is under the hand of God, what God allows. So Jesus says, I've got all this authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, since this is true, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always. You know, it's kind of a bookend. I've got all authority in heaven on earth. And now at the end of the verse, he says, remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So he bookends it with his power. So. There's been all manners of sermon and teaching and theology taking from these verses, right? And they're very important to us. But to be honest, for each of us as believers, it must set our course and explain the end game of why we are here. A couple of things before we move on from this. Therefore isn't in the Greek. What's in the Greek, it reads like this. As you go, make disciples. It doesn't say, here's a command, go out and do this. No, it says, as you go, make disciples. As you go, make disciples. So as you go to work, to the gym, to the bank, as you go, make disciples. It doesn't say, go out and hammer your neighbor, neighbor with tracks and hang things on their door, although you can do that if you want. But, but Jesus says, as you go, kind of in your routine, in your flow of every day, as you go doing what you do, make disciples along the way. Now, when he says make disciples, that's a process. And making disciples assumes that you are one. Yes? As you go, make disciples. Making disciples is a process, and it assumes, it implies that you are a disciple in order to make one. You see, make disciples of all nations. This is a worldwide endeavor. You are the South Reno connection, whatever part of town this is. But we're all part of this worldwide endeavor. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And not necessarily the pastor baptizing. I can't find that verse where the pastor is the only one that baptizes. In fact, what we often did in Susanville was we would have the person that led that person to faith baptize them. Or we would have fathers baptize their sons or, or mothers baptize their children, whatever it was. It's, it's not, oh, oh, come to church and our pastor will baptize you. No, you baptize them. So, teach, actively participate, teach these new disciples Actively participate in teaching these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. 
Once again, Jesus is implying that you know the commands that he's given to you in order to teach them. Yes? So, and be sure of this, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. The assurance that you can do this is given to us by Jesus. Be sure of this, I'm with you always. And for a little more clarity, the definition of a biblical disciple is this. One who accepts and assists in spreading the doctrines of Jesus. Yeah, you're slide behind there, fellas. Help me out. <laughs> One who accepts and assists in spreading the doctrines of Jesus. Any disciples... Two, one, two. Okay, just making sure you're getting what Jesus is asking of us. You've got a building now. The responsibility is greater than it was. To those who've been given much, Jesus said, much is required. And you've been graced with this place. And I don't want to make it all about the place. But what I want you to understand is what we are called to do. And this is one of the things that we use to do what we've been called to do. Both Matthew and Mark, they give us a bare bones accounts of Jesus calling the disciples. Remember there was uh, the four fishermen, to Simon, to Andrew, to James and John, and they were fishermen. Jesus simply said, come follow me. I'll show you how to fish for people. I will make you fishers of men. Come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So as we follow Jesus... There's this transformation that takes place. We learn to fish for men. And this was a very new phrase for these fishermen because they knew fishing for fish. And all of a sudden, this stranger with this aura about him shows up and says, follow me. I'll show you how to fish for men. What? What did he say? Fish for men? What does that mean? But Jesus said, I'll show you. I will teach you. It's a process. You follow Jesus. Jesus teaches you, and then you fish for men. Now turn with me to Luke 5. Jesus gives us a fuller picture there. Luke 5, verse 1. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. This is kind of the same, um, part of the same incident here, but this is from Luke. So Luke chapter 5, verse 1. One day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. Great, they were pressing in. So Jesus, Jesus noted two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. So understand, Sea of Galilee, most of the fishing at that time took place in, at nighttime. Fishermen would go out at night. They would fish in the shallows because that's where the fish would gather. So fishing was done at night. Fishing was done in the shallows. So this is early morning. They're done fishing. They're cleaning their nets. The empty boats are right there. The crowd's pressing on Jesus. So he says, he noticed two empty boats at the water's edge. For the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So Jesus was out in the boat, pushed away from the shore, and he taught the crowds from there. Now Simon is being polite, but watch what happens next. When Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where it's deeper and let your nets down to catch some fish. Huh. You see me? You see my brother? You see our nets? You see my boat? You see my fishing hands? And you rambled up here this morning, sat in my boat, and now you're going to tell me how to fish. Simon probably wasn't happy about this moment. But because at this point, Simon is still polite. You know, Simon is Peter. He says, Master... So Simon is giving Jesus his due. He calls him master. So he says, master? Simon replied, 
We worked hard all last night, and we didn't catch a thing. We fished all night in the shallows, and we didn't catch nothing. But, Peter says, if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And remember, Jesus said, go out where it's deeper. And this time, their nets were so full, they began to tear. A shout for help brought Simon's partners in the other boat, James and John, and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. And when Simon Peter realized what happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus, and he said, Oh, Lord, please leave me because I'm a sinner. I had a bad attitude a couple minutes ago. You asked me to do some things, and I didn't want them to do them, but I'm going to be polite, and now you prove me to be an idiot. But I'll do what you said. And, and the boats were about to sink. And, and, and Peter fell on his knees. He said, oh, Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him, his partner, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They were also amazed. And Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. As soon as they landed, they left the biggest catch of fish they ever had and followed Jesus. Don't you think he still does crazy stuff today? We've tamed Jesus. We've turned him into a picture on the wall. We've turned him into some kind of icon. Jesus is dangerous. Jesus should strike awe in our hearts at the things he does. So let's talk about fishing for people. So again, let's consider the call of Jesus. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Another way where Jesus said, we're going to expand and enhance my kingdom. Fishing for people has always been the way to enhance and expand Jesus' kingdom. And Jesus was the master of fishing for people. Remember while he was having dinner at the house of Zacchaeus? Remember that? He was having dinner at the house of Zacchaeus. And Jesus said, Jesus imposed himself on Zacchaeus. Remember Jesus is walking through town, just in the tree. He's a short guy. He can't see Jesus. And so he gets in the tree. Jesus says, hey, going to your house for dinner. Who does that? Who does that? Dave, Dana and I will be by for dinner. Okay, yeah, who, who does that? Jesus, yeah, I'm coming to your house for dinner. And so Jesus goes, and I got to imagine something good took place because we read this in Luke 19. Jesus says at the end of the evening, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man, Jesus, he came to seek and save those who were lost. You know what this tells me? Go have dinner with your unsaved neighbor. Invite yourself if you have to. Or be polite and invite your unsaved neighbor to your house. Right? It's, this is how we fish for people. Another time, Jesus is at a tax collector's, tax collector's dinner party at the home of Levi. Remember Levi, and, and he was taxing, and Jesus said, uh, you know, Levi, come follow me. Levi said, great, come to my house for dinner tonight. So what kind of friends does a tax collector have? Tell me. What? Other tax collector friends, right? If you're a tax collector, you don't have pastors as friends at this day. When you're a tax collector, the only people that like you are other tax collectors. So Levi is having a tax collector dinner party at the home of Levi. And that's a pretty less than virtuous dinner, right? And so, Luke chapter 5, verse 32. The Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. Why do you eat and drink with such scum? And Jesus answered them, Healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I have come 
to call not those who are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. That's fishing for men. See, if you just gather here with the people you like and sing the songs you love and enjoy the preaching that Dawson gives, you've misused this place. Because this is where sinners need to be welcomed. This is where you bring your neighbor and say, let me show you what life in Christ looks like. And then, you know the story of the Samaritan woman. She was at the well at noon. And you know why the Samaritan woman went at noon, right? Because none of the women go and get water at noon. The Samaritan woman went at noon because all the gossipy women went at 6 a.m. So the Samaritan woman who was living with a guy and had five wives, she sure wasn't going with the other women at 6 o'clock. So she's going at noon saying, oh my gosh, I hope none of them are here. And so when she gets there, no, the women aren't there, but Jesus is. And so what happens? Jesus shares with her who he is. Jesus transforms her life in a moment. And in John chapter 4, verse 39, many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because of what the woman had said. He told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged Jesus to stay in their village. So he stayed for two more days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. And as I study these, I realize that fishing for people is simply building a bridge to the unsaved. It's simply a smile. It's simply a word. It's simply accepting them as they are and then letting Jesus clean them once he catches them. But here's a harsh reality. Here's the harsh reality, church. The truth is, many Christians have stopped fishing for people and they become keepers of the aquarium. Many people, show that slide if you will, guys. There you go. Many Christians, I'm glad that's like giant. Many Christians have stopped fishing for people and become keepers of the aquarium at the church building. Because you know what? This isn't intimidating. This is good. This is fun. This is pleasurable. This is enjoyable. You know what's not fun and enjoyable? Fishing for sinners. They are mean. They are ugly. They are atheists. They make fun of us. They ask questions we can't answer. You see, being keepers of the aquarium is enjoyable. Worship songs, the pastor, Friends with a common faith, united in our love for Jesus. Kumbaya, my Lord. Kumbaya. Is there anything better than kumbaya? But fishing for people is hard work. Fishing for people is hard work. Show that next slide. Oh, there's that word. Oh, you're, you're talking, you didn't say it yet, but you're talking about evangelism. No, I'm talking about building a bridge to your neighbor. I'm talking about loving the kids that run across your lawn. How many of you are like that person? You kids, get off my lawn. None of you guys do that? Okay, good. So next time they run across your lawn, tell them about youth group. Next Sunday night at 6 to 7.15 or whatever it is, right? Tell them we're having spooky church. What? Who doesn't want to go to spooky church? So, fishing for people is hard work. Unpredictable, uncomfortable, puts us in awkward positions. They ask a lot of questions. They challenge our faith. They bring up all the problems they see in the church. They talk about the hypocrites they know. And most of us feel ill-prepared to fulfill the job description given to us by Jesus. I had to believe that those people in the early church found it much more comfortable to gather together than fishing for people in the ugly, 
harsh Roman world. But we are still called to be the church. And our job description is not changed. We continue to find reasons to satisfy ourselves rather than to fulfill the mandates of our Lord and Savior. The end goal of following Jesus is to become like Jesus himself, to think as he thought, to feel as he felt, and to act as he acted, and to desire what he desired. So, Mountainside Church, God has blessed you with an amazing facility. What will you do? Will you hunker down and enjoy the sweet communion of yourselves? Will you become keepers of the aquarium? Or will you become a fishing hub where friends, colleagues, and the surrounding community is introduced to the love of Jesus through your smile, your unity, and your warm embrace. Click me ahead there. There we go. Today, this is not the time to sit back and say, we've arrived. No more set up and tear down. Oh, thank you, Jesus, we've arrived. Oh, this is so nice. This is nice. It's time, church, to roll up your sleeves, get in the game, and honor God by being the church and living out the job description that he has given to his followers. So I'm going to ask you to simply bow your head, if you would, Close your eyes. I'm sorry, I grew up a Baptist, so this may hurt some of you. But I want to ask you a couple questions in your heart. What might you need to change in your walk with God in order to embrace the job description to be fishers of men and women? What might you need to change in your walk with God in order to embrace, not give lip service to, but to fully embrace the job description that we see throughout the New Testament. For you and I, the followers of Jesus, to be fishers of men and women. And what are you willing to do? Question two. What are you willing to do in this new season at Mountainside Church so that God's kingdom is enhanced and enlarged here in South Reno? Those are tough questions. They're not easily answered. But I pray that God has spoken to you tonight. I pray that God has given you a vision of what your next move might be here. I pray that you are now mindful of what our Lord said. To those who've been given much, much will be required. Father, in the stillness and the quietness of this place. Challenge us with the truth of your word. Father, cause us to be honest in the depths of our heart, what you've called us to, what we're doing as we look around at a world gone crazy. There is still a place for the kingdom of God to be preached. There's still room in the kingdom of God for others to be added. And God, we know that you're not finished yet because your greatest desire is to seek and save those who are lost. Father, make us fishers of men and women. May we see what you see. And may we do what your son did build bridges to a broken and dying world. Amen and amen.